Well, I was reading about how there was a prayer ring for one of the former American Idol contestants. Um, and instead of making fun of it, I decided to join it. And that's this first poem right here. <laughs> Idolatry. I must brave the hysteria sprawling the Grand Sikkim Mall, plant myself at the snake tail of cerulean-haired grandmothers and tween orthodontic patients lined up to meet you, Clay Aiken. <laughs> When my turn arrives, and eye to eye with you, the idol, the man, the almighty, seated in the regal chair normally occupied by Santa Claus and the resurrection rabbits, I will ask you to autograph your name under the well-endowed title of your debut CD, The Measure of a Man. Laser etched with your impassioned testimony that if you were invisible, you would watch me in my room and make me yours tonight. I will pray for a picture, me nestled next to your pixie frame, to grace the wallpaper of my laptop and my living room. Lavished with life-size statues of you, I financed on Clayaway. I will, I will present you a sharpie, rip my fan shirt open, beg you trace my tattoo of your earthy name, Clay. The sea hinged on my soul blade of chest hair, the Y leaning against my left areola. And I will say, whoa the day America relegated you the top runner-up when Ruben stuttered the velvet teddy devil from the 205, squashed your elfin 919 spirit. But my faith remains aching, not stirred. I would still sacrifice my every night and weekend minutes to cast more ballots for you than all the candidates who contested the Bush dynasty combined. I can't keep enough copies of your Christmas album to harmonize with your ringtones I downloaded onto my Clay TNT. <laughs> I worship out the South Orange County chapter of the Church of Claymates where we genuflect toward your anemic feet and proclaim you no false idol. My Lord, your name is never to be forsaken. You are my master and I am forever aching for you. Uh, this is a haiku. Since I'm Japanese, I'm kind of obligated to do one. Um, here we go. Voluptuous curves, budding hips, blossoming breasts, I need to lose weight. <laughs> this last poem uh, is dedicated to Fred Korematsu, and it's called Enemy Combatant. On a serious tip here. When the greatest American president of the 20th century orders you and 120,000 other American citizens to camp, you say no. But only because Ida Boitano, a beautiful Italian-American, says yes when you ask her to marry you. You say no to Executive Order 9066 because you'd rather pick flowers from your family nursery for a picnic with your fiancé. The government posters in Oakland ordering you to report to the racetrack to reside in horse stables sound no different than your mother suggesting you stop messing around with a hakujin. You alter your name on your draft card, transform into a Spanish Hawaiian, pay a plastic surgeon to carve away the Japanese in your eyes so you can disappear in Arizona, tucked inside the hideout of her tender arms. But a local merchant rats you out, cops yank you to their car, and your once future wife waves goodbye to you forever as your handcuffs restrain you from waving back. <coughs> Suffocating on Utah desert dust instead of swimming in the oasis of her eyes. Inflamed by sagebrush and tumbleweed instead of the lush waterfall of her hair. 
You fight your internment in court, and you lose. You appeal, and you lose. You fight all the way to the Supreme Court, and you lose. But each stinking defeat eclipsed by the loss of your lover, whom the FBI pressures to never speak to you again. Fred, when I first studied your case, I relegated you to an accidental footnote, an unprincipled resistor, a lame plaintiff in the pages of history, because you only said no to hide with your amour, because Topaz was just a camp where you couldn't concentrate without your wife-to-be. Today, 12 years after I learned your story, I love a woman named Dima who dances a mean debke, warms her cold feet between my thighs, curls up to me like her cat hobs, and whispers poetry in my ear, as perfect as the little dipper of dark freckles on her back. Like you, I asked her to marry me. She said yes. And if the government ordered me behind barbed wire, allowing me only what I can carry. I know I couldn't stuff my heartache into a suitcase. Fred, now I finally understand. You were fighting for love. You spoke up for Bernard Flowers and anyone else driving while black because behind every arrest, some sweetheart somewhere drowns in distress, submerged near the empty side of a bed. You fought for Jose Padilla and detainees in Guantanamo Bay because even so-called enemy combatants leave lovers alone under the moonlight. So as the government stains your name, the precedent it cites to suspend civil liberties due to so-called military necessity, I proclaim your name sacred, the source of my strength to face down the 31% of Americans willing to cage my beloved behind the same fence you once stood just because she is Arab. I adore her so much, if anybody threatened to cuff my hands away from hers, I would fend off an air force, fist by fist, to remain struggled at her side. And I declare Executive 9066 is any state who tells me I can't love another man, any church who tells me I must be chosen, any father who tells me to keep my blood pure, any magazine who dares to find beauty, any activist who tells me not to sell out, any prison glass window, any security fence, any national border that separates me from my lover's lips. You are my hero, Fred Korematsu. You are one man standing before a row of tanks fighting for our right to love. And when your heart pumped its last beat, March 30th, 2005, my heart fluttered as I kissed my fiance a few seconds more. Let every embrace linger until each of her exhales safely landed in my ear. And I swore the greatest enemy I would combat is the one who dare stand between me and my beloved. Yeah. Thank you very much.